The item five on the order paper is the adjournment. The question is that the Assembly do now adjourn, and in conjunction with the Business Committee, I have given leave to John O'Dowd to raise the matter of COVID-19 outbreak in Craig Alvin Area Hospital. The proposer of the topic will have 15 minutes, and I call Mr John O'Dowd. Uh, thank you, Karen Crowley, and I doubt if I take the entire 15 minutes because it's quite a considerable interest uh, in the debate and to allow other members in. Can I also concur with your remarks in relation to Mr Bailey uh, and, and condemn the threats against him? Uh, I know he's faced them before and I won't deter him from, from his task, so I, I wish him and his family well and his mothers. And I also acknowledge the fact that the, that the Health Minister has been in the Chamber a lot today uh, and uh, acknowledge the work he's been doing uh, over this last number of months in relation to COVID-19, uh, his task is not an easy one, and I'm not here to berate him. I'm not here to make his task any more difficult. I'm here to support his department, himself, the staff of Craig Avenaria Hospital and the other, the, the other hospitals that have been dealing with COVID-19 over this last number of, of months. But the, the task of an MLA and the task of the Assembly is also to hold that count. And that, that's, that's how I present myself uh, to the Assembly and to the Minister today. Minister, I'm going to take a wee step back uh, from Craig Alvin Hospital and take a few months back. Because when, when over this last number of days and weeks when we've been debating this issue, families have been in contact with me from other areas. And I want to highlight to you uh, an issue in relation, because I, I, I'd said to you previously in previous debates, that I wasn't aware of any other acute hospital that had a COVID-19 outbreak. And that was my position up until yesterday when I was contacted by a family who said that they had been impacted by a COVID-19 outbreak <coughs> in a hospital, in Antrim Hospital, in April of this year. Now, that was at the height of the COVID-19 outbreak, uh, which will probably become known as the first wave uh, as we enter uh, another serious era. Uh, and they... Uh, are now engaging with the health authorities. They're in, they've, they've been in correspondence with your department and your office. Uh, and I go into greater detail outside the public because they don't want their family's name in, in, in the public realm. But they have informed me that there was an outbreak in the Antrim Hospital, and this was in the media afterwards, in Ward 6, Ward C6 and C7 of Antrim Hospital. And that there is at least two deaths associated with that outbreak. And I raise that in conjunction with Craig Avon Area Hospital, because as I said, I wasn't aware of any other incidents. But the family now inform me that after significant engagement with the Northern Trust, that there's now a serious adverse incident, level two, being carried out into that uh, outbreak. Now, strangely enough at the time, there's no, the media report, reports refer to I think it's 19 members, 24 members of staff had tested positive. But there's no reference to patients uh, at that time. And the reason I highlight it is this, because the serious adverse incident which the family have now got the, the trust to call was announced to the family in around the 5th or 6th of August. But yet, there's no chair appointed, there's no panel appointed, and the investigation hasn't started. Move forward to the last week or so of, of August, and we have an outbreak in the emergency department of Craig Alvin Hospital, where I think two members of staff were impacted and others had to isolate. Move forward then to the 25th of August, which I think is the first date that uh, the, there's an announcement there's an outbreak in the haematology ward of Craig Alvin Hospital. And significant numbers of staff were impacted. I think around 14 members, 14 patients were impacted. Uh, and then we move forward a week or so, and we have the announcement that there is an outbreak in three sites, a number of staff impacted, and also a number of patients impacted. And I, I bring a question to the, to the Minister in around the 7th of September to the Chamber and ask the Minister what his plans are. And the Minister announced a serious adverse incident, level three, the highest level there can be. But Minister, as I said to you yesterday, there's no chair appointed, 
There's no panel appointed, and the investigation hasn't started. And from the 7th of September, when four patients have died, we have now six patients who have died. Daisy Hill Hospital has had an outbreak, and we have had five patients die in Daisy Hill. And I understand there is evidence, though not proven, that there is a relationship between the outbreak at Craigavon and the, or, or Daisy Hill and Craigavon. Now, I'd provide further information again outside the chamber to the Minister in that regard. But, Minister, I, I'm beginning to question as to whether a serious adverse incident is the best way to deal with this. Because I, I'm, I'm looking into the matter more and more. And when I uh, listened to the Chief Executive of the Southern Trust this morning on, on the airwaves, I, I was concerned when, when, when the Chief Executive said that they haven't agreed yet the terms of reference, or the Chair has not been agreed yet to be appointed. And I'm asking myself, is the Trust agreeing the terms of reference? Is the Trust to confirm the Chair? Because the Chair is supposed to be independent. And I would like to think that, if not the Minister, uh, I, I would like to think it was the Minister who was appointing the Chair not the trust, and that the minister, in conjunction with the chair, would approve the terms of reference. Because the investigation has to be thorough and it has to be independent. And that's why I, I question, is it perhaps needed that we move this beyond the trust? Not that I have any evidence to suggest that the trust is mishandled or to blame for the outbreaks. I haven't. Uh, and I'm not pointing fingers of responsibility of anybody in the senior management or the executive of the trust. But given the scale of the outbreaks, given the scale of the deaths involved, then I think this may have to be moved beyond the trust to another body, to uh, 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 another agency, or another group of individuals to carry out this investigation. But my other concern then is time, because it's two weeks since the announcement Numbers, multiple deaths since, and lessons have to be learnt. And I'm concerned, and I know the Minister has said uh, the Trust has been engaging with Public Health England, and they're giving advice. Uh, but is that advice, and the Minister may want to respond to this, is that advice going out to the, to the other hospitals? Because if this outbreak, if the sources of this outbreak can be identified, as I said to you yesterday, it's either person, equipment, or process. And I accept that COVID-19 is in the community, so that our COVID-19 will or can get into our hospital settings. But if we don't know how, we don't know why, and we haven't got set up the investigation, then there's a danger of it happening again. In, in researching for, for today's debate, Minister, I, uh, I looked at the deaths associated deaths of COVID-19 in hospital over this last period of time. And from the, on the 25th of August, when the team of haematology ward was announced that there was an infection on it, at that stage, deaths in hospitals stood at 561. Today, they stand at 577. So the death toll during that period grew by 16. 11 of those deaths are associated with the outbreak in Craigavon Hospital and Daisy Hill. 75% of hospital COVID-19 deaths are as a result of patients catching COVID-19 in the hospital, which is shocking in itself. So I come back to my point. We need the investigation up and running. I have concerns as to whether the serious adverse incident is the right way to do it, but my bigger concern is this. Time is not on our side. And I would urge the minister to appoint the chair, to appoint the chair and an agreement with the Chair set the terms of reference and get the investigation up and going. So our health service, our health workers, uh, and all of our patients and our communities can have confidence that the matter is being tackled in an independent manner and that lessons will be learned from it very, very quickly so we don't have further outbreaks in other, or we minimise the risk of further outbreaks in other hospitals. And I'll end on this point. The figures are available for the deaths in hospital. The figures are available for the infections in hospital, but I am having difficulty in establishing how many people have been infected as secondary infections from the outbreaks in the hospital. And I am aware of a number of cases, including at least one death 
with a partner of someone who has died has uh, been infected. And I, I suspect there's others. And I'll end on this note. The Antrim case, the patient who died of COVID-19, his wife died several weeks later as a result of COVID-19. So it not only impacts on the patients, it impacts the family. So I said I wouldn't take up all my time to allow other members in, but I leave those points with the Minister. And I thank the member for that. I mean, there is, there is obviously lots of interest in this particular uh, debate this afternoon. Three members are present from the constituency, and they will have five minutes each to speak, and all other speakers will have three minutes, and there can be no extra time for interventions. So take interventions at your own peril. So I call Diane Dodds. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and to advise the House that I rise to speak in my capacity as the MLA for Upper Ban. Can I also, Mr. Speaker, uh, associate myself uh, with the remarks to my colleague, uh, Doug Beatty? I hadn't heard of, of the threats. Um, I think it is reprehensible that um, a public representative should uh, have those threats levelled against him. Um, and I trust uh, that all will be well. Um, Mr. Speaker, I also think that before we, I begin my remarks, I would like to extend my sympathies to the families of the six uh, patients of the haematology ward in Craigavon Area Hospital who tested positive for COVID and sadly lost their lives, and also to the families of the five patients in Daisy Hill who have also lost their lives. This is a devastating time for them, and our thoughts and prayers are with them at this very difficult time. As other members have rightly said, on behalf of the people of Upper Ban, I want to express my gratitude and thanks to the doctors, nurses, and support staff at Craig Avon Hospital who have been to the fore in protecting our community during the COVID-19 pandemic. They have been at the front line of the battle against COVID, and it is their commitment that has saved so many lives during a very difficult and uncertain time. We all owe them a huge debt of gratitude. However, given what they have done for us, we need also to ensure that there is no repeat of the events that we have witnessed at Craig Avon and Daisy Hill. We also owe it to the families of those impacted to learn from these, uh, to, uh, by these events that we get to the bottom of what happened and to learn and take action to ensure that such a tragedy does not strike again. Mr. Speaker, it is also essential that we instill confidence back into the community and hospital users, reassuring them that the hospital is a safe environment. And I have had uh, contact from a number of patients, some who are incredibly ill um, and fearful because they may have to go in uh, to hospital. That is not a good situation for us to be in. During the pandemic, we did witness a huge drop off in those attending hospital, even when they needed to do so. And we need to avoid a situation where people feel unsafe using the hospital as the long-term consequences would be absolutely devastating. My message to people from Upper Ban is simple. If you require medical attention, you should seek it immediately and use the hospital that resources that are there uh, for you. The decision by the Minister to announce a Level 3 Serious Adverse Incident uh, is an important step in ensuring that we get the answers as to what happened at the hospital and what measures we need to put in place to ensure the safety of patients and staff. However, I am extremely concerned that this has not moved forward, and I look forward to the Minister outlining further details of the investigation to this House um, as this debate closes. Any issues that have already been identified um, and any early findings from any uh, preliminary investigations that have been carried out so far by the Trust, and I know that some of this has taken place. It is important in these uncertain and difficult times that we find out the truth for patients uh, and constituents in Upper Ban, and indeed so throughout the Southern Trust um, area. The Minister does have my support but I believe, like all members here this evening, 
that we do need to get answers and that the families involved deserve answers. Indeed, the frontline staff deserve answers um, and that the importance of restoring trust and uh, confidence from patients at the hospital is at the absolute foremost of our concerns this evening. Um, this is uh, a very difficult time and we've seen over the last uh, 24 hours how this pandemic continues to impact on our community and indeed um, right across um, the, all of our services. Hospitals are not immune from those uh, issues. Um, any more than any other environment. But we do need to make sure that our patients, the most vulnerable amongst us, are protected, taken care of. And I look forward to finding out uh, where um, the investigation is at and would urge that we proceed with haste in finding out the answers and providing solutions so that these dreadful things don't happen again. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, and I call Dolores Kelly. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank uh, Mr. O'Dowd for securing uh, the debate this evening. Uh, and it is welcome that the minister is here to respond. And uh, like uh, Mrs. Dodds, the minister does have my support. I'm sure he's had many, many sleepless nights uh, around uh, the issue of trying to deal with this pandemic, and in particular in dealing with grieving families and those staff on the front line. And um, I would want to place on record my sincere condolences to those people who have lost loved ones, both in Craig Avon and at Daisy. Hill Hospital because it's not just the loss of the loved one, there's also the whole right, if you like, of funeral and grieving. Uh, some of that has also been stolen. And Mrs Dodds is right to point out that people need uh, security about feeling safe whenever someone they know and love has to go to hospital. It is my understanding uh, that uh, so far um, the emergency department has seen a significant drop again in terms of people accessing uh, care. So there is a huge communication and confidence building um, issue and, uh, uh, that needs to be addressed by the trust. Um, others have uh, commented, Mr Speaker, in relation to the imperative of getting the answers uh, and giving reassurance to families that this investigation hopefully will bring. But I also want to concentrate on uh, the staff as well as the, the people attending. Um, it's my understanding, um, Minister, that um, through you, Mr Speaker, that, uh, that many staff um, are very distressed that they're very distressed, not just about the outbreak of the pandemic, but the second spike that is coming and the implications that has for them and their families. Um, I know uh, family members who have to gown up and wear all of the uncomfortable gear, if you like, to protect them and others. And um, uh, the many nurses, as, you, as members here and doctors uh, will know, suffer outbreaks of their skin. There's, there's quite a huge emotional and physical um, a cost to the staff and I would hope that in any uh, review uh, that the staff are part of the consultees in terms of what they see that needed to be done because I know infection control has worked really hard and Craigavon Area Hospital has actually been a, a, an award winning hospital in relation to infection control so <clears throat> I know this is a very unusual pandemic and we're still learning about the disease itself but there's something there that has happened from an award-winning hospital to one now where we've had uh, these number of deaths and people infected whilst in hospital. It has to be answered and reassurance um, must be given. But also, uh, in, in the brief time available to me, Minister, I want to draw your attention, uh, Mr Speaker, to relatives and uh, the, the clampdown on people visiting, that's also having an impact. I mean, there's the issue of people having that occasion of joy being present at the birth of a child and how that's been addressed. I think there's, from what I hear on the ground, there's a wee bit of clamping down and almost bolting the stable door after the horse has bolted a wee bit, you know. And there's also uh, issues of people, uh, I know about end-of-life care and letting visitors in, but in some cases, people... Um, 
you know, th th there's how that's defined. I, I know of one family who recently weren't able to be with uh, at the bedside of a loved one because of how that was defined in terms of end-of-life care. So I think there has to be greater clarity. I also have had constituents contact me who want to know about the status of their loved one and there have been problems with the uh, contact in the ward. And I know staff are run off their feet, but there are some management issues that need to be addressed. Simple things that can help to reassure people who are in distress, who are worried, who even want to know simple things like, uh, do I need to go and collect my mum? Can I go and collect my mum's uh, night pyjamas and stuff like that and be able to bring home and replenish uh, the, the toiletries and all of the rest? How is all of that managed? So uh, from what I can hear on the ground, I do think that the Trust has a wee bit of work to do at some of the practical measures. I also know that uh, some staff feel that, um, that that a lot is asked of them by managers without managers actually experiencing at first hand what it's like to be in the red zone. And, and I think there's a need for some of the senior staff to step up to the plate and to go in and see what they're asking, what we as politicians and others and the public are demanding of the nurses and doctors on the front line. And I, I'll end on this point, Mr Speaker. I think we all have a civic responsibility, as others have said, around the public health messaging uh, about looking to ourselves and what we are doing to try to diminish the spread of this infection. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. And I call Doug Beattie. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. I may first of all thank you for uh, your kind words of support, along with other members here, uh, in respect to the, the threats that I have received, which I, I pay little attention to. I'd also like to thank the, uh, the Minister for yet again um, being in the Assembly um, uh, to, to, to listen to uh, this debate. And finally, I'd like to thank yourself, um, John, for, for bringing this debate uh, before the Assembly, because it is an important debate and it's a microcosm of what could happen um, uh, in the whole of Northern Ireland if we don't adhere to uh, the health regulations that are being put before us um, by the, the executive. So, without a doubt, what is going on uh, in Craigavon Area Hospital um, is, is of real concern. I mean, these are life and death issues we are talking about here. We're not talking about just um, a, an issue with infection control. We're talking about people who are dying. We're talking about families who are grieving. Um, uh, and we're talking about trust uh, which is uh, being damaged. But over the height uh, of this COVID pandemic, it's, it's worthwhile noting that Craig Avenue Area Hospital dealt with more patients th than the Nightingale uh, Hospital did. Uh, Labelled as having an ICU with impressive um, recovery rates, they are a trusted COVID service deliverer. They set up two emergency departments, a respiratory and a non-respiratory, in order to provide high levels of care and stop the spread of COVID. It was focused. It was dil diligent, it was deliberate, it was rigid, and it worked. What am I trying to say here? Is I'm trying to say that our staff in that hospital have absolutely done a huge effort to protect the people in that area and the wider of Northern Ireland. But sadly, we, we have had an outbreak, uh, and we've had an outbreak uh, with disastrous outcomes. Uh, and we all feel for those who have lost their lives, and we all feel, of course, for their family members. And there is, uh, uh, as we've said, a level three serious adverse incident uh, investigation being initiated. Uh, and the member says that, that it hasn't started yet. And, and I guess that's, that's a worry. Um, but for me, if I'm really honest, I'm slightly more worried about making sure that we contain the outbreak. Yes, the investigation is important. Yes, we need to find out the reasons why. Yes, there needs to be a learning account. But you see right now, as we stand here, there needs to be a curtailment of the outbreak to save lives. And if we can save lives, and then we could possibly deal with the issues afterwards. Where did the outbreak emanate from? The answer is we just do not know. Did they emanate from Somebody out there who refused to wear a mask, somebody out there who refused to wash their hands, somebody out there who went into a crowded space and passed it on to somebody who works in the hospital. We don't know. We're surmising. And that's all we can do until we get the results of the investigation. But what I want to ensure is that the commentary around us does not demoralise the staff in Craigavon Area Hospital. I've spoken to some of them, and some of them are feeling demoralised. 
Four, over 4,000 people work in Craigavon Area Hospital doing a Herculean job. That is clinical and non-clinical staff. Doctors and nurses, cleaners and porters. And they are working day and night. And I do not want to demoralize them, but I do agree uh, with the member, we have to get to the bottom of this. It cannot happen again, and I certainly don't want to see it anywhere else uh, in Northern Ireland. But I also want to make sure that the people who work there have confidence in the hospital and the hospital's uh, leadership. And I want to make sure people who are using the facilities have confidence to use those facilities. What I don't want is sick people staying away. So in trying to find out what went on and why we had this this, this, this awful, tragic outbreak. I, I don't want to throw away the baby with the bathwater. Uh, I want to make sure that we nurture those people who are working there. We acknowledge what they have done for us uh, previously, what they're doing for us now, uh, and address these issues through an investigation. But first and foremost, for me, I want to see that outbreak contained and stopped in order to save lives, and the learning account for me can come at later. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Paula Bradshaw. Mr. Speaker, I didn't realise in three minutes, so I'll have to skip through my speech here. But um, I just would like to place on record my thanks to the um, member for bringing this um, issue here today and giving me the opportunity to put on record my sincere sympathies and those of my party of those relatives who have of the deceased um, who have sadly lost their lives. Um, hospitals should be safe places, and I'm sure those people who are working in them have been absolutely devastated themselves with, with, with these um, deaths. Um, it, months ago, we had the surge plan that came in from the Department of Health, and I suppose at that time it was put together um, with great haste and learning very much from previous pandemics and outbreaks, and we came across this term that in the Health Committee with a new term of institutional amplifiers, and I suppose a lot of the, the work that went on in terms of trying to keep this hospital and other hospitals free um, from infections were put in place very readily. So I wonder, um, in terms of this hospital uh, and certainly Craigie Avon and, and Dizzy Hill, you know, what, what has that particular trust learnt and what are they doing in, in quick time to actually move from the surge plan, the original plans that were in place to keep the hospitals, um, the hygiene controls in place, and what are they doing now? I'm very concerned um, about this um, serious adverse incident um, process. I have spoken to um, bereaved parents um, and, and relatives over the years who are so concerned about these SAIs. They say that it's about marking your own homework, they're always delayed, it's only certain people get involved in them, and they really don't get to the, the nub and the, the butt of the problem. So my concern is this is kicking the can down the road in many ways around what actually happened, and it's not going to actually put in place in quick time changes around um, the infection control measures. Um, I suppose the second point I want to make really is around, as John O'Dowd had referenced there, um, you know, we had the incidences in Antrim Area Hospital. We've had these, these two hospitals. I'm sure there have been others. And as, and, and as health committee members, and certainly I as a health spokesperson, have always been very keen that we have transparency about the, around these outbreaks, around these clusters, so that you know, the, the, the general public and those people working in them and their, their relatives of people staying in can also be, have access to that information because it's so important then um, that we, we all act responsibly and, and even more so when, whenever there's, there's instances like this going on. Um, so, as I say, we need to be assured that things um, are, are done differently going forward in these, this, these hospitals because we know that there's the lag between being affected and then suffering from the disease. And I suppose um, I, I would like to hear from the Minister about what additional measures are going into those two locations to um, stop the spread of the virus. Um, I think I'll draw that to a close, but um, I just want to put on record my thanks to the Health Minister for being here today. He's had two very long days, and it's not an easy job. Thank you. Okay, and I call William Irwin and just remember all members will have three minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I welcome the opportunity to speak on this matter today? And this Grey Avon Area Hospital is part of the Southern Area Trust and serves my constituency of Newry and Armagh. This is an issue of importance to my constituents. I wish to personally sympathise with the families of those patients who have very sadly passed away as a result of the virus. In the hospital setting, my thoughts and prayers are with those bereaved families 
at this very difficult time. As you know, there's been a concentration of COVID ID outbreaks within the clinical setting of Craig Alvin Hospital. Patients and staff tested positive for the disease, and following the sad deaths of six patients, the Health Minister has instigated the investigation via a Level 3 serious adverse incident into the circumstances surrounding those outbreaks. That investigation, I believe, is vital to establish the reasons as to how that outbreak occurred. There have been three identifiable outbreaks at Craig Avon, and we all realise, of course, that given the complexities of the virus, no one can give a cast iron guarantee that, with the highest regard for safety, it is possible to completely prevent spread. However, in the hospital setting, there is an understandable public expectation that such outbreaks will be prevented, at the very least, minimised. Therefore, how the situation has escalated so quickly needs to be established. We acknowledge the good work that has been undertaken by all staff within the hospital over many months in preventing outbreaks. However, people will be concerned by these developments at both Craig Avon and now Daisy Hill. They will be concerned about the deaths that have occurred, and they will be rightly inquiring as to how this happened. The past few days, we have now have a situation whereby a level three serious adverse incident has been declared at Daisy Hill following infection outbreaks, and sadly five patients uh, deaths there. There are certainly worrying times for everyone in the hospital setting. It is important to establish, quickly establish the reasons why we have experienced this type of outbreak in two hospitals within the Southern Trust, and if identified causes can be established, and then acted on to prevent further outbreaks. Is testing sufficient? Awards getting kept, at getting the type of deep cleaning they require on a regular basis, or rules being adhered to regularly? These are all questions that need answered. Uh, the fact of an outbreak with someone potentially dying as a result is, of course, the greatest concern, and sadly, that has happened across both sites in recent days. However, there are many more factors to consider, for instance, the impact on hospital services, such as planned surgery and all treatments being cancelled. Uh, with staff having to isolate and the massive impact this has in terms of patient outcomes. I raised this point yesterday with the Minister and I thank him for coming before the House again today. The level of staff now in isolation is a major and concerning knock on effect of this current outbreak across the two sites, and it is a huge worry that necessary medical procedures due to the current times up have been postponed uh, as a result. Um, I would call on the Minister uh, to act as quickly as possible to ensure uh, that this situation is rectified as soon as possible. That, uh, I hope up. that everyone can turn to work as soon as humanly possible. Thank you. And I call Colm Gilderney. Robin, uh, the Minister, for attending what has been certainly a couple of very long days in relation to major health issues. Um, on behalf of the Health Committee, I want to extend sincere sympathy to those who have contracted COVID-19 in both Craigavon and Daisy Hill Hospitals, and in particular to the family of those who have died following hospital-acquired infection. I know their loss is compounded dreadfully in these circumstances, and there is so much hurt and understandable anger among relatives. I must also acknowledge the distress and disappointment felt by the healthcare staff and leadership, dozens of whom have uh, staff dozens of whom have also been infected in the line of duty. I know, having worked tirelessly throughout the pandemic, the workforce must be feeling demoralised and upset that harm should come to the very people they are trying so hard to help. I realise they are also bearing greater pressure due to the resulting staff absences. The Committee has welcomed the announcement of the Level 3 Serious Adverse Incident Inquiries in the Southern Trust. This process, however, can be lengthy and it has been, a, of, of, it has been challenging for families in the past. It is very important, I believe, that families are involved centrally from the outset, updated regularly throughout, and provided with all the support they need at this time and in the future. While we must allow the SAI to run its course and not prejudge its findings, nevertheless, I do hope the opportunity will be taken for early and widespread sharing of any preliminary lessons learned with a view to reducing the risk of outbreaks elsewhere. And I was pleased to note the Minister's commitment to that rapid learning process in the Chamber here yesterday. 
I know the health and social care workforce and leadership have been on a rapid learning curve with this, with this virus since the start, and that so much more is known now than six months ago. That mindset has never been more valuable. The committee will want to know what has been learned or has still to be learned about the type and use of PPE in these circumstances, for example, or about other infection control measures or interaction between health professionals or approaches to testing and monitoring. Essentially, what is required to ensure that patients and staff have the protection and the support they need as we face into the coming challenging months. The committee has been seeking to play a positive role in scrutinising the res pandemic response, feeding through the challenges on the ground and seeking to hold public body bodies to account while making a constructive contrib contribution to decisions. In keeping with that, the committee will want to see the report of the inquiry as soon as possible and look to support and highlight the lessons learnt and key public health messages raising. It is also important to state that as we see increasing transmission of COVID-19 learning, the lessons of outbreaks will be vital. I will also say that I have been contacted by families, and it is not an exaggeration to say they have been devastated. Now Finally, the best up. tribute to those who have died and promise to those who are suffering must be that we act together to prevent further instances at all costs. I wish the Minister well and look forward to detailed engagement. Thank you. And I call Palm Cameron. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I think, first and foremost, we must remember at the heart of this debate here this evening are broken hearts and grieving families. And my sympathies go to all those who have lost family or friend in Craig Avon, Daisy Hill and indeed beyond. I am also cognisant that this evening we are awaiting the outcome of the action taken by the Minister in announcing a Level 3 serious adverse incident investigation. And that is the right route for the Department to take, and I think it is best to let that investigation determine what exactly happened here, what the feelings were, and then we can learn from this. There is clearly a problem here, but rumour and innuendo serve no purpose in establishing concrete fact. Facts are what are needed and so that they can be acted upon, so that the unanswered questions families have are answered and to learn lessons. I would urge the Minister to proceed with haste and that the investigation is swift and thorough. There is also a very important point to make here, Mr Speaker. Let us also remember that there are considerable numbers of staff who are also brokenhearted, anxious and deeply moved by what has happened to patients in their care. And I know that many nurses and doctors, and indeed I am confident that those who work in the haematology ward, will be deeply distressed by the loss of their patients. Their dedication to their job is second to none, and their awareness for the need for impeccable infection control is also clear. So I think we need to be measured in what we say here this evening, Mr Speaker, and we all want answers. However, the need to reinforce the public health messages that can save lives, whether that be in hospital, ward or in an office, a restaurant or home. For Mr Speaker, this virus is going to be with us for some time, and we need to protect our hospitals, our care homes, in order to save lives. We need staff to be diligent, we need the public to be diligent, and we as legislators need to ensure that they have the resources and the support to be diligent. There are serious questions that need answered in this sad case. That is very clear. Families need them, the Trust needs them, our wider health service needs them, and we need them. I thank the Minister for his action and wait the outcome of that investigation and trust that there will be a uh, very minimum of delay going forward with progressing with the SAI. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Les Kimmins. I'm going to thank my colleague John O'Dowd for bringing this uh, adjournment debate this evening. Um, I too wish to extend my condolences to all the families of the deceased, um, both in Craig Avon and Daisy Hill in my own constituency. Um, and I thank the Minister for coming here because I, I do appreciate it's been a very tough uh, couple of days. Um, without going over what everyone else has, has said here this evening, I um, too welcome the news that there, there will be an SAI. But I do have concerns, like others have said, about the effectiveness of this, um, particularly as we need to get answers as soon as possible to ensure um, this does not happen again. But I do believe there is immediate learning that we can be looking at um, around key issues. Just today, I have been contacted by family members of patients on Mail Medical in Daisy Hill, um, who stated that they were not made aware at any stage of an outbreak on the ward. Um, this has currently had ma major implications for their families. Um, their, their family member is currently in Craig Avon, um, and their, their associated members are self-isolating while they await test results, uh, which obviously has wider implications. 
Similarly, staff have been in contact with me to say they found out first about the outbreak through the media, which is concerning. Um, and, and in a time when we want to ensure staff feel valued, I think this can, can damage, d damage that too. So I think, Minister, there needs to be more transparency, that we, we ensure that, that rumours don't circulate, that people are getting the correct information, and that staff, patients and their, and their families have better awareness and are more diligent in, in their day-to-day -day, um, activities. We feel there needs to be better communication, both from, from the Trust and from, from here in the Assembly, to ensure that people remem remember the stark message that, that this hasn't gone away. And, you know, we, we know that this is something that can get into our hospital settings. We're, it's, it's, it, everything, nothing is impossible, but it is important to, to keep that message uh, alive. And I think one of the biggest issues I've learned over the last number of days is, is around testing. Um, there have been issues, and I have raised them with the Minister, and, and I don't want to go over those points again, but um, particularly for staff and patients and their families, having difficulties accessing t uh, testing has, has proved really um, challenging, and it's obviously impacting on staff and levels within the hospital and then for, for people in their wider lives. So I think coming out of today, in, in the immediate um, aftermath of this, we as elected reps and the senior management in the Trust need to work very, very hard to rebuild confidence, because confidence has been damaged here. Um, for, for myself, in terms of Daisy Hill, we were advised this would be a COVID-free hospital, and there's been a serious upheaval as people were moved to Craig Alvin, and we, we've lost our ED for a number of months now. And I think this proves the, the need for ED to come back, as we see Craig Alvin is, is almost bursting at the seams with the level of workload that the staff are, are managing at present. Um, so we do have a huge job of work to do, and I think we can, we can do that, but it's important that we get a rapid response and that, that this is communicated clearly to the public. Thank you. Can I call Justin McNulty? Gurmayogut, Kun Korla. I thank the member for Upper Band for bringing this important and German debate today. Um, I cannot stand here today and pretend that the outbreaks at Craigavon Area Hospital are not linked or connected to the outbreak at Dizzy Hill Hospital. 25 patients have tested positive, 11 patients have passed away tragically, 44 staff have tested positive, and 112 staff are isolating. 11 families are in the depths of grief, and my sympathies are with those families. They need answers. The words of Yvonne Stewart, who I spoke to, are ringing in my ears. Her father, John Fleming, was admitted to hospital for routine medical treatment. He has since been buried. She deserves answers. Yvonne Stewart could not thank the, the, the staff the doctors, the nurses at Craig Avon Area Hospital enough. The level of care she said her father got was exceptional. 112 staff are off isolating between two hospitals. Can you imagine the duress that puts on wards on the remaining staff? Those staff need reassured that the lessons that need to be learned will be learned and learned fast. Patients and their families need reassured. The wider community needs reassured that their hospitals are safe. I welcome the announcement of the serious adverse incidents, Level 3, and the, the subsequent investigations that will take place in both hospitals. And those investigations must take place post-haste, and I am not filled with confidence when I hear the Chief Executive of the Trust on this morning on the radio talking about still deliberating over the terms of reference. But I will, pre I will hesitate I do hesitate to preempt some of the findings of that investigation, but a fundamental finding I believe will be that staff were not listened to. Staff were not listened to. Why did they have to come to me? Why did they have to come to me with concerns around testing and delays to testing? Why did they have to come to me with concerns around deep cleaning of the ward, about deep cleaning of the canteen? Why did they have to come to me concerned about why infection control was not engaged fast enough? Why did it come to me concerned about staff being moved from a COVID ward to a clean ward? Staff were not listened to. I want to finish by paying tribute to those staff. The doctors, nurses, porters, cleaners, cooks. Where would we be without them? Craig Alvinary Hospital is an exceptional hospital. Daisy Hill Hospital is an exceptional hospital. And I agree with the member for Newry and Armagh. We need to see our AD open in Daisy Hill Hospital as well to ease the pressure on Craigavon Area Hospital.
Ramagat and I call Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I too uh, rise to support Doug Beatty and also the Minister on, on being here and I acknowledge the huge challenge that you face along with your team and it, it cannot be an easy day any day. Regarding Craig Avon Area Hospital, and, and I appreciate, I thank the member for bringing this forward, but I appreciate since that was probably presented to the business office, the situation has changed and now also does include Daisy Hill, which is a, a recipient hospital for South Down. Both hospitals um, take quite a big intake from there. And from my perspective, I see, Minister, that there are two channels at work here. There is that retrospective piece that needs to happen regarding the serious adverse incident. Unfortunately, for those families who have lost loved ones, that will bring nobody back. But what it will do is provide them with the answers that they so rightly deserve at this time. But I do share the concerns of the House that that process may be laboured and slow. It may be the old tool in the box, which was cricked quickly grabbed in these uncertain times. It may be that it isn't the best tool for this job, but it was the easiest to grab. And I would work with the Minister in any, in any suggestions he would have to inject some speed into that process, to bring forward anything that needs to be learned quickly, to move on to that second channel I refer to. And that is the pace where we have to act fast and respond quickly to lessons that could be learned that could save future lives. On that note, I also refer to, and my colleague from uh, Nuri Arma referred to it, that staff and patients need reassurance. I don't want to find out from the floor of this House that cleanings happened because we asked. I don't think that's how staff should be finding out the, these reassuring words. There appears to be a real breakdown in communications from the trust to the staff and the patients. They do need to know that everything that can be done is being done. And if that communication channel opens, more rapidly and it be a two-way communication channel, I think that will put an end to the room where rumour has grown. Having spoken to people working on the ward and families who have patients on the ward, I urge you, Minister, please use this opportunity to reassure them. It's all they seek at this time. They need to know that they are safe that the most that can be done is being done to keep them safe. They need to hear it from you, they need to hear it from Member the trust, and they need to hear it from management within the hospital. I thank all those staff, and I thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Jerry Carl. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and thanks to Mr O'Dowd for bringing this important um, uh, a discussion tonight. I think it is important that even MLAs outside the area um, uh, give their thoughts on, uh, uh, on this issue. And I want to begin by offering my condolences and sympathy and solidarity uh, and support to the families who have lost loved ones due to this uh, recent outbreak at uh, Craig Avenue Area Hospital uh, and to all those who are battling uh, for their lives and their health at the moment. Uh, my thoughts are obviously with them all. And this is obviously a very a uh, highly sensitive issue, and, and because of this, I think it is important to, to choose um, words uh, carefully. Um, but of course, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I don't claim to know the full details of what happened in Craig Avon Area Hospital, uh, or indeed in, in Daisy Hill. But it is a deeply worrying uh, situation when highly vulnerable uh, patients who are free of COVID are admitted uh, to a hospital where they then come into contact with this virus to be met with obviously the most tragic of fates in some circumstances. And like our care homes, uh, these hospitals should have, um, should have had maximum protection from this virus at the very start. But unfortunately, uh, much like our care homes, some of these hospitals and, and staff in them and patients have been failed at the various stages um, throughout this crisis and over the years as well. Uh, we have to ascertain why uh, what happened happened, and obviously there needs to be a full, um, not just a SAI, but a full inquiry into these events, uh, which should be directly informed by the families, and they should get the answers that they deserve. 
but uh, we should not, as others have alluded to, I think we shouldn't disregard uh, those people, such as health workers and their respective unions, because health workers um, have been failed throughout this crisis, uh, from the denial of PPE to the more general rundown of, of services throughout this uh, pandemic. And as uh, Mr McNulty alluded to, they, they, may, they may have raised concerns prior, I do not know, but I think it's important that if they did, that that is listened to uh, and uh, addressed. Um, I say this, Mr. Speaker, because, um, as I ar articulated earlier today, there's elements uh, within this House who are going to great lengths to blame maybe ordinary people for the spread of virus, to talk about reckless individuals or re referring constantly to house parties. But I think the reality is that the same reticence to shut down workplaces in the first place fueled moves to reopen them prematurely and in an unsafe way uh, increase the spread. Uh, of the virus uh, and possibly threatening more deaths, whilst creating a context where many people began to draw the conclusion that if you could go to work, uh, then why not socialise with friends, etc. Uh, and just last week, um, I asked the First Minister to divulge the medical evidence that showed COVID spreads among six people uh, in the homes, but not in, in the workplaces of hundreds. Um, I asked the Health Minister today, I take it he, he was obviously rushed in some of his comments today, uh, but on both occasions uh, we haven't got the evidence uh, to uh, ascertain why it does uh, spread in homes, but not simply times up. in workplaces. So I want to give my, my sympathies uh, to those, those families and hopefully this uh, tragedy doesn't happen again. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, I now move to call the Minister of Health, uh, Robin Swan, to conclude on this debate. And uh, the Minister would have 10 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, um, can I thank uh, Mr. Adoid for, for proposing this German debate? And I thank the opportunity to further address the House on COVID-19 and the outbreak that we've seen in Craig Alvin Area Hospital and the related issues in, in Daisy Hill, which uh, I commented on yesterday in response to Mr. McNulty's urgent question. Um, Mr. Speaker, I want to, I suppose it's starting where Mr. Carl left off, is to ensure that this doesn't happen again. And it's about ensuring that we have the support within our health services and our hospitals and to the staff that we make sure that we, we can do all that we can in, in addressing the, the spread of COVID-19. Because, Mr. Speaker, I, I want to express my sincere sympathies to the loved ones of those who have passed away and reiterate that, that I'm deeply sorry for the heartbreak and loss that these families have suffered. Thorough investigations are absolutely essential, and I am determined that no stone will be left unturned to ascertain the facts about these causes and these cases and any learning that we can take to prevent a, a further occurrence. Mr Speaker, while we do all that we can to protect ourselves and our society from the risk that this virus constantly poses, our citizens should expect at all times the highest standards of infection control to be in place across our entire health care facilities. So in light of these recent clusters, the Southerns Trust immediate priorities are firstly to care for affected patients and staff and prevent the further spread of the virus, and secondly to ensure that the appropriate investigations are initiated with involvement from the families and supported and I suppose controlled by, by my department. I have been clear that this is a very serious matter, and as I have said previously, uh, a thorough investigation is required so that patients and bereaved families receive the answers that they are entitled to. The Southern Health and so Social Care Trust um, is and has confirmed that the Level 3 investigation, SAI investigation, will be extended to include the outbreak at the Mayo Medical Ward at Daisy Hill Hospital. Um, this investigation will be independently chaired, and as I've said, its findings will be made available to the families impacted and will be made public. As I said in the House yesterday, I expect the independent chair to be appointed by the end of this week. Um, that independent chair is, and I'll give, you know, give John that uh, assurance, the independent chair is appointed and, and selected in conjunction with the Health and Social Care Board and the Public Health Agency. And one of the things that I've said is the terms of reference and why they haven't been finalised yet is that that independent chair has input into the terms of reference, but also importantly that the families have input in, in, into the terms of reference. I've met with families who have been three, through uh, an SAI level three, and to say their experience 
was not good. It wasn't supported right, and they weren't supported right. So when I declared um, this um, this outbreak to, to, to warrant a level three SAI, it wasn't as the member said because it was the only tool in the box. It's the tool that I had to ensure that we could get to the answers that the families and the staff um, also need. So uh, I think, as I said yesterday, we expect that chair to be in place by the end of this week, and we will move uh, as quickly as is practical to get the answers. Because, Mr Speaker, it's important to be very clear at this stage that whilst we want an expeditious investigation, we simply cannot put a timeline until we have greater clarity about the underlying causes which the investigation will provide. Because the SAI is about learning, and it is vitally important that we are thorough in our investigation and take every opportunity to learn from what is these tragic uh, circumstances. I and my department are in regular contact with the Southern Trust, and I want to assure the public and those patients and the staff that all necessary measures are being taken, firstly con to control these outbreaks, and secondly to investigate um, the, causes, the, the circumstances that have caused them, but also give them that reassurance that all is being done uh, to make sure that those patients are safe, the families are supported, and their staff are also important again, because time after time, and here tonight, we have acknowledged the work um, of the staff that has been undertaken. The Trust, as I said yesterday, is working with the Public Health Agency and Public Health England to make sure that the management of the response is of the highest standard and the necessary lessons are learned right across our health and social care system. And the Trust is taking uh, that necessary learning from Public Health England to identify the actions that can be taken now to support the patients and the families. Because Public Health England has already gained experience of outbreaks, and we want to learn um, from them and apply the learning that they have here in Northern Ireland, but also make sure that that learning isn't just for the Southern Trust, but across all the trusts um, in Northern Ireland. Because um, across these islands, Mr. Speaker, we all have the same desire, and that's to ensure that our patients, staff, and visitors have access to safe health and care in our hospitals. These, these are unimaginably difficult times for these families, and I want to assure them that the Patient and Client Council is available to advocate on their behalf and to provide that independent support as they engage in this process with the Trust and the investigation. And I said that here yesterday, that those families, if they are reticent about the support from the Trust or don't think it is, is going to be an open and transparent, that's what the Patient and Client Council are there for. But I also want to take this opportunity to reassure the staff working through these still unprecedented times to care for their patients and their loved ones, that they are supported in the work and the daily challenges that they are presented with. This isn't about a portion of blame. It is fundamental that we learn from this and we take robust steps to ensure the safeguarding of our staff and patients in all our hospital settings. Mr Speaker, I have listened intently to the debate today and to take note of members' concerns and frustrations. Because, Speaker, I also have those same feelings, and I want to, I want to provide a brief update received, uh, that I received from the Southern Trust on the patients and staff um, who have been currently affected. And it's not because Ms Bradley said about hearing the, num or the reports in this House. This is the information I have received today, so it's only right that I provide it when I have it, because we have had calls of transparency and clarity. This is the information I have received. In relation to Craig Avon, 14 patients tested positive. Six of those um, have sadly passed away. Five remain uh, in patients in two north respiratory for ongoing clinical care, and three are, are at home. In Craig Avon, 146 staff have been tested, 23 of whom have tested positive, and 45 and total self-isolation. However, 26 of that 45 have now returned to work. Such is their dedication and commitment. And I think it was as Mr McNulty, when he was speaking about their staff members, and they're not just the nurses or the doctors, they're the cleaners, they're the porters, they're the entirety there. And so often we look at our health and social care workers as workers in a job. Mr Speaker, they carry out a vacation and a ded dedication that I have seen no equal to in the past seven months. In relation to Daisy Hill Hospital, 13 patients have tested positive, five of those who have sadly passed away. Uh, we have one at home, and the remainder have been transferred 
to Craig Avon in line with the Southern Trust protocol for management of COVID. 204 staff to date have been tested, 28 of those whom have tested positive, and 73 in total are self-isolating. And I want to say to any member in here, if they know of members or family members who have concern getting tests or access to tests, please come forward and let us know, because they are accessible to Pillar 1. Uh, Speaker, I want to respond briefly to a couple of points uh, also that have been, been raised. I can confirm that enhanced cleaning is taking place on both sites uh, several times each day, particularly in outbreak wards four times per day, and also in donning and doffing area, areas. Touch points and staff terminal, these measures are guided by best practice, proactive advice from the Public Health Agency and the learnings from Public Health England. Mr Speaker, would you indulge me with an extra couple of minutes? I have an extra page. I will I'll finish in time, but I think it is vital that I, I convey the, the, the answers that I have here, and I appreciate your, your indulgence. These measures, are, as I say, are guided by best proactive advice from the Public Health Agency and learning from Public Health England. On the question of staff moving across hospital sites, I want to discourage uh, the type of unfounded speculation that has been heard about this. I have received provisional data on genotyping um, of the outbreaks of those who have tested positive, and so far there has been absolutely no link between staff who volunteered to help out across sites and the transmission of COVID-19 into Craig Avon Hospital. Staff working flexible across our sites is not uncommon and is safe. It is one of the strengths of our workforce. But I must stress this important point. The staff who came into Craig Avon went from an amber PPE site to an, um, to an amber PPE site. These, these are standard infection and control measures which staff observe in order to prevent any transmission from one location to another. Nevertheless, Mr. Speaker, these cases are a stark and tragic reminder that this virus is amongst us and is very much at large in our community. I know that people want to get back to normality uh, and with our children going back to schools and colleges and with many people returning to some kind of work pattern, it feels a little more like normal. Mr Speaker, these are still not normal times. We have to live our lives in the shadow of this terrible virus until the time comes when we have a safe and effective vaccination. Everyone is feeling the pressure. Each and every one of us, we must remain robust and not fall prey, prey to the complacency that is creeping in upon us. In regards, Mr Speaker, a number of members referred to the rumours and the speculation, I will say, and I have always said to this throughout this pandemic, that that sort of rumour and speculation is unhelpful. It is what undermines our staff morale the most. It is what puts questions into families' heads that do not have answers, because often that speculation, that rumour, that innuendo, without ground, without basis, is the one that does the most damage. In conclusion, Mr Speaker, there are undoubtedly questions that will have to be answered by the Trust in relation to these outbreaks once the immediate threat has been brought under control. The necessary steps are underway and any lessons will be shared across all health and social care trusts as they emerge, because COVID-19 remains a lethal and highly infectious virus. Mr Speaker, I thank you for your indulgence. Uh, thank you very much. And first of all, could I just thank all the speakers this afternoon who have uh, contributed in this debate. Uh, the substance and the tone of all the contributions have very adequately and appropriately uh, reflected the gravity of the situation raised here today. And as I say, I'd like to commend all of the speakers for their uh, very worthy contributions. And uh, on that debate, on that point, then the Assembly stands adjourned. Thank you all.